All right. Well, it's good to see everybody in this fifth week of meeting on a Monday night under the tent. What a good number this is from side to side, end to end. We're full and people keep on coming and what a good number. How many is tonight? You say, preacher, this is my first time under the tent. Would you raise your hand? Look at this. Hey, Brother Heath, look around. Praise our Lord. Thank you for being here. God bless you. And uh, we've been getting phone calls all day. I told Brother Heath this morning that my phone started about 6 in the morning. It's rung all day. People was talking about being here in the meeting and wanting to come from. Started with Newland. People living right around the area. Haven't been to the meeting yet, but they said, we'll be here tonight. Then I got a call from someone in Asheville. They said, we'll be here tonight. We heard about it. And then a man from Indiana said, I've already left. He said, I'm here this morning. He said, God spoke to his heart about 9 o'clock last night in Indiana. and said, get to North Carolina. He said, I drove eight and a half hours just to be here. I wanted to get in on what God was doing. Amen. And we thank the Lord for the drawing power that God's put on this meeting. And people coming from northeast, south, and west. And we give God all the glory for it. So let's stand to our feet. Brother Terry Roberts is going to lead us. Let's all sing this good old number. Let's magnify the Lord and go to church. Amen. Thank you. How many is glad to be saved tonight? You know, if you're here and you're not saved, it'd be a good night to get there. Hey, hallelujah. Let's do the dearest friend I ever had. When I was free.
to thank you for the wonderful singing tonight. And uh, we want to go to God in prayer this evening. And I know the rain had a little bit of a bearing on those who were gathered outside of the cross. And Brother Rim called our prayer wagon. Me and Brother Heath and a few, we crammed into John Burt's prayer wagon out behind the tent tonight. Crawled in their vehicle and we had a prayer meeting there. And uh, we appreciate where the Lord can hear you. He can hear you in a, in a vehicle around the rock altar, but he can hear us in this service too. And we want to go to God in prayer. How many understand tonight that all is vain unless the Spirit of the Holy One come down? We need God. And we're so honored for every one of you to be here. But here's what we've got to understand. If all of us are in this room tonight, just us, nothing of eternal value is going to happen. We'll entertain each other. It'll be a great time. But only if God gets in this service, if God takes over, will things that have truly last, will things be accomplished tonight. And we want to dedicate this service to the Lord. And I want Brother Rim Austin, I want him to come and lead us tonight. I want all the men of God, if they would, all of our preachers to come, if they would, and join us around the altar. The men of God under this tent, it's such a blessing night after night after night to have the support of men of God who believe God, who have a heart for revival. And I appreciate the local pastors, the people right here in our area who believe God, believe in revival, and want to see God do some great things. I heard this quote today, and we're going to pray. And I thought how true, how appropriate it is for this hour. We've clipped the wings of faith with the scissors of reason. We've tried to explain it away. We've tried to tell people why we can't see revival no more. But our God can still send revival. Our God can still do the impossible. Our God can still draw the sinner and save their soul. Brother Rim, if you'll lead us as we pray, let's all pray together tonight and dedicate this service to God. Our kind and gracious, most heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for this day. God, I thank you, Father, you've allowed this God to come boldly into the throne of grace this one more time. Father, I thank thee, God, that thou hearest thee always. And, Lord, I'm thankful, God, there ain't never a time, Father, our prayer didn't get through to heaven. Father, there wasn't never a time the phone line got disconnected. There wasn't never a time the weather caused the line, Lord, that you couldn't hear us. But Father, I'm thankful, God, you're a God that hearest us always. Father, I'm thankful tonight, God, that you know every need, every circumstance, every situation, every prayer, Father, even when we can't pray, you understand the tears, Father, that fall from our face. And God, I pray tonight, Lord, that you'd touch us, Father, in a great mighty way. I pray, Father, you'd help us, Lord, God, to set pride aside. Father, that we'd leave it outside of this tent. God, that you'd be glorified. You'd be uplifted, Father. You'd be manifested. Father, and everything said and done. I pray, God, that you'd help us, Lord. God, to just uplift you. Father, everything said, everything thought, everything, Lord, that's been uplifted, God. I pray, Father, you'd be glorified. Father, everything, God, that come out of every door, every crack, every crevice of this tent, Lord, that tell up towards the heavens, I pray, God, it'd be a sweet, savoring smell under your nostrils. I pray, God, tonight for our nation. I pray, Father, you touch our leaders. I pray for the nation of Israel. I pray you touch us, Lord. Help us, God, to be a help. I pray, Father, for the lost one here tonight. I pray, God, that you'd convict them. I pray you'd reveal it unto them. Father, I can't even begin to fathom, Lord, what it must be like to come in unknowing. Father, undesiring God, just come in just because somebody invited you. But, Lord, like you said in 1 Samuel, Lord, that Samuel knew not yet because the word of the Lord was not yet revealed unto him. And, Father, I pray, Lord, that you'd reveal it unto a few tonight. I pray, God, you'd make it real tonight, Father, to a few here. Lord, would you make it real tonight, God? I pray you'd draw to this altar. Lord, put a drawing power on this place. God, put a drawing power on your man. I pray, Father, you'd give Brother Heath liberty. I pray, Father, you'd give him holy unction. I pray, Father, you'd illuminate his mind, God. I pray you'd loose his lips. I pray, God, that you'd repeat him directly. God, the man of Father come down from heaven from the throne room. I pray, Father, you'd get ahead of him. Lord, get behind him, Father, on four corners on the east side. On the west, God, I pray you'd protect your man. I pray hedge protection round about this mountain. I pray, Father, you touch, Lord, send your angels down. God, we stand in need, Father, tonight. Lord, to see a holy moving of the manna. Lord, a holy moving of the Holy Spirit. Father, a holy moving of Jesus Christ himself. 
Father, we need you tonight. God, we need to see you, Father. Lord, we need to see a thing supernatural. God, would you give us something fresh to do? God, would you show us that tonight? Lord, how we stand in need. Father, I thank thee, God, for the desire you put in people's hearts. Lord, to be back in your house tonight. Father, I thank thee for those which stand by. God, those which came, Father, the weather's dreary. Lord, the way is dark. God, things don't look right. But, God, you've shined on top of a hill, Father, underneath a little tent way back in the mountains of western North Carolina. And, God, I thank thee for what you're doing. I thank thee, God, for what you're fixing to do tonight, Lord, in our scene. And I pray, God, that you'd be uplifted. God, would you have your will and way here tonight. God, would you do that that only a God in heaven can do. And I pray, Father, you'd do that. God, be pleasing unto you. I'd be pleasing unto your Son. That God himself, Father, get all glory. Because you're worthy tonight. Father, we thank you for how you're moving throughout churches. We thank you for how you're moving throughout your people. And God, I pray, Father, tonight you'd breathe. Lord, one more time, would you come down and meet with us? God, how we stand in need tonight. Lord, I pray, Father, you'd be uplifted. God, holy is the Lamb, and worthy is his name tonight. And worthy is your Son of all praise and all glory and all manifestation. And God, we just want to uplift you tonight because you're worthy, Father. And Lord, everything about you, God, is altogether lovely. And Father, I pray tonight, Lord, your will be done. And Father, I pray you get us out of the way. And Lord, you just have your way tonight and do that that only you can do. God, we ask, Father, all these things in Jesus' sweet and precious holy name we pray. Amen. You know, in these days that we're living in, meetings like this are so precious. They're special. We live in a world of hurt and pain, suffering, fighting, backbiting. It's even leaked into a lot of our churches. But it's a blessing to come up to a mount like this and all be unified under the same cause to lift up the glorious and wonderful name of Jesus. Jesus is the only one who deserves our praise tonight. We're not up here looking for your praise or your applause. We're wanting to point you to Jesus. You say, why? Because simply this, if you've never been here, maybe you've never been raised in church, you say, what does all this mean? What are you doing? The Bible teaches us that we've all sinned. We've come short of the glory of God. And because of our sin, because of our failings before God, the punishment is death. The punishment is sickness. It's not God's fault that there are hospitals and cemeteries and mortuaries. It's not God's fault at all. But as we talked about Friday night, as Sister Michaela sung, and she's about to sing again tonight, whatever God puts on her heart. As we talked about Friday night, Brother Heath so eloquently preached the message, gave you the gospel of Christ. Jesus come to this earth, left heaven to die on the cross for your sins. He gave his blood because God the Father said without the shedding of blood, there's no remission. The blood is the most precious thing you have. It's where your life is at. The Bible says the life of the flesh is in the blood, Deuteronomy tells us. And Jesus gave the most precious thing he had to offer. It wasn't just his tears. He shed many tears for you and I. It wasn't just his compassion. He proved that. But he gave his life's blood. He gave his life for you and I on a cross and said, God, I want you to forgive them. If he'll ask you for their forgiveness, for your forgiveness, you'll forgive them. I want you to do it for my sake. And that's why when you come to an altar and you say, after you hear the Holy Spirit speak in your heart, you say, God, I'm a sinner. Please forgive me. Please save me. God doesn't save you for you. He saves you because of Jesus. Because he remembers what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary 2,000 years ago in your place. You should have been the one dying on the cross. I should have been the one suffering in punishment. But Jesus took the wrath of Almighty God. And because of that, we're up here 2,000 years later after the crucifixion of Jesus, up here on top of a mountain magnifying Jesus. Why wouldn't me? Jesus died for us. Let's magnify him. And as we told you, Sister Michaela is coming to sing tonight. As we talked about Friday night, Jesus didn't stay dead. Because he was God, he got up by his own power. And he walked out of the tomb. And he's alive, he's alive, he's alive. And we've had many infallible proofs all throughout this meeting. Pastors have been calling me in the last day and so. And 
Pastors called me last night, yesterday morning, said, you're never going to believe what God's doing. And I said, well, I can, I, after what I've been seeing God do, I can halfway believe it. Pastors calling me that people under conviction since Friday night, falling in an altar yesterday morning, getting born again by the grace of God. That, that victory yesterday, I see seeing people walk in that God had changed their life. I mean, these are the miracles. You say, none of this is real. Well, explain that to me. You say, God can't do it. Explain to me how in the fifth week of meeting we're on top of a mountain with a packed out tent, a tent full of people believing God and worshiping God and magnifying His name. Our God is alive and well tonight. Whatever your need is tonight, Jesus can meet that need. You pray for Sister Michaela as she sings and after she sings, her and Brother Kogan, what a blessing it is to have them back with us in the service. God so worked this out to where our friends, our prayer team, could be right back with us. I appreciate Brother Kogan and Sister Michaela. You pray for them. And then afterwards, Brother Heath is going to come. I love this man of God. He's got a message from the Lord, and I want you to hear him gladly. Open up your heart tonight. Don't be distracted. Don't let nothing get in your way. Listen to the Lord. Whatever he says to you, like Mary told those disciples in John 2, just do it. Follow him and obey him. The key to all of this is simply obedience. Obey the Lord. Whatever he says, just obey it. You pray for him. Seems every time that we come to his throne. We bring petitions but forget our song Asking questions like Lord how and why Or just complain about how hard we try But if he were to ask this time This might be the question on his mind don't you think you ought to worship me? Don't you think it's time you spend some time With your hands up in the air Offer more than just your prayer And give me what is rightly mine Yes, it's true, I want to hear from you All your questions and your Give me all your doubts and fears, but there's more I want to hear. It's time for you to worship me. singing a lot of us we get so caught up in life and we got so many problems so many trials so many situations in our lives and we start looking at it all and then we look to the Lord and we say well God you need to help us God you need to bless us God you need to deliver us from this trial and I, I'm glad that we can bring our burdens to the Lord I'm glad that we can cast it all at his feet I'm glad that he takes care of us and delivers us but we so many times forget 
how worthy he is of all the praise, the honor, and the glory. See, that when, right when we get on our knees, we just start asking him for stuff. When really he's saying, can't you just fall on your face and bless me? Can't you just honor me? Can't you just give me a little bit of glory? And tonight I just want to remind you, he's more than just your helper. He's more than just somebody that gives to you. He is the King of kings and he is the Lord of lords. Matter of fact, he is the great I am. He is the lily of the valley, the bright of the morning star. He is God. He is Jehovah Jireh. He is El Shaddai. He is the all-eternal God. He is the mighty God. He is the Prince of Peace. He is God alone. He is powerful. He is mighty. He is awesome. And He is holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty. And if there's anything, we ought not just worship because of what He's done, but tonight we ought to just give Him a little glory of because of who He is. It's high time that we just worship the Lord.
I don't know about you, but he's worthy tonight. If you're saved tonight, in your right mind, not in hell and not in jail, I think we ought to just give him a little praise tonight. Maybe the Lord wants you to just bow at this altar. Some people already made their way. Maybe you just need to come love on the Lord a little while. The Lord likes that. The Lord likes it when you love on Him. He sure loved on us a lot. Maybe you're saved tonight. Why don't you come praise Him a little while? Come give Him a little glory and honor. He deserves it, doesn't He? He's worth it. Maybe tonight you just think about these four. This is the fifth week, these past four weeks. Maybe God has done something so amazing, something so powerful, and you just need to thank Him for it tonight. We ought to be grateful for what God's done these four weeks. He's done some amazing things. He has done the supernatural. Maybe we just need to thank Him before we go any further. Maybe we just say, Lord, thank You for what You've done thus far. Before we take another step, God, we just want to praise You. Whatever it is tonight, He's worthy of the praise. You just glorify Him. He's something to you. He's changed your life. He's a good God.
there's so much to be thankful for tonight. And we give God all the praise. Amen. And the service Amen. isn't over yet. Oh, yeah. We've come to one of the most important parts, the most important part of the service. Amen. We thank the Lord for the singing and how it prepares our soul for the preaching. And there have been nights where the Lord had already done the preaching and Amen. God moved in the service and took over. But we believe it's the Lord's will for God's man to come and preach. Amen. So let's pray for God's man. Brother Heath Williams, you hear him gladly tonight. Brother Heath, you come. Well, if you love the Lord, say amen. amen. I got to be honest with you. I've always been excited to come up to the tent and get up here on the hill. Uh, but after not really knowing for much of last week if we'd ever even come back together this time, this year. On, and uh, certainly if it was the Lord's will for it to close, it would have been right. And we'd have shouted the victory. But I'll be honest with you, I'm just as thrilled as I can be. Oh, yeah. At least have a few more nights together, the Lord will. And uh, I'm pretty sure the Lord's in it and he's happy about it. I've felt him since we got here. He's a good spirit underneath this tent. And I praise the Lord. There's been some Mondays. I thought I might about die last Monday. We had to plow so hard. And uh, I tell you, I, I take this any day. And I know God always does it different. That's how we know it's real. You ever get in something where they do the same thing every night, you better watch out. Something's off. The Holy Ghost has moods and has his will. But I appreciate these times when he loves on his children. And I bless the Lord for that. I had these in my pocket. Didn't even know I did. It was raining. I didn't want it to smear. And a few things the Lord put on my heart after seeing some of the young folks uh, Begin to write their burdens, their prayer needs on them wood chips with a sharpie and markers. And they intermingled them up there in, the, in our altar to pray. And so I just felt impressed. I found them in my coat pocket getting here. And I'm going to put mine down later. They couldn't dry it out. And things the Lord's put on my heart. And I just want to encourage you. You say, well, preacher, we only got three nights. Well, I'm pretty sure I serve a God that can do it in less than a day. Nonetheless, in this tent, if it didn't end on Wednesday, that's not the end. That's just the beginning. Amen. So by faith, the Lord puts it on your heart. You put them up there in that altar, and we're all praying over each other's needs, bearing one another's burdens. Yes, Bible is very clear. He'll bless you praying for somebody else Amen. more than he will yourself. That's the heart of God. And so you do those if the Lord puts that on your heart and I appreciate you being here. No doubt many of you has been praying uh, because the Lord's here. Amen. And he doesn't have to come. And he doesn't just do that. It's not a coincidence. It's not a coincidence that so many new people are here tonight. Somebody's been praying. Somebody's been calling out on God. Somebody's been believing the Lord. The Bible says, but without faith, it is impossible to please Him. And I trust that tonight. While the Lord's around, that God will speak to your heart. No doubt there's many needs here tonight. You might be here tonight and you're lost. I pray tonight you'd find out that the best thing that could ever happen to you is what happened to a bunch of us. And that's the day that the Lord came by my way, saved my soul from an eternal hell. Nothing's better than that. You might be here mixed up in sin. I pray tonight, tonight you get things right with God. Have your joy restored. Might be here tonight and you're just seeking to get closer to God. I believe what the Lord has got for us tonight will speak to everyone. And I trust it will be a blessing to you. You've got to hang with me in this message now. It starts a lot rougher than it ends. So don't give up on me in the beginning. You've got to lay the groundwork to get where the Lord wants us tonight. So if you have a Bible, if you would, uh, turn with me Second Samuel. Chapter number 12, 2 Samuel chapter number 12 tonight. When you see it, you'll notice for a lot of us in here, this will be very familiar scripture. Uh, looking out of the life of David, I appreciate Brother Cogan, his sensitivity to the Lord. And testimonies and songs of Miss Michaela touch on their lives. and They're singing and testimony that sure makes preaching easy when they honor the Lord. And they sang a song 
multiple songs, really one of them I never heard before, but they all tied in with David. And how David in one of his lowest points in his life found out there's a God who's still rich in mercy. And just when he thought it was all over, God says, I'm just getting started. Yes, there was a price to pay, but there was mercy that could give him back some things in his life. And I bless the Lord for that. And I hope it'll help you tonight. You stand with me. Second Samuel chapter number 12. Again, thank you to all the visitors, all the first timers, high school, college especially, young people being here. That's our hope. That's our future. That's my generation. And just when they said there's no hope, about every night half the tent's been young people. And I thank the Lord for, for that. And thank you to all the staples. We'll call you that. Been here every night since the beginning. You're probably so tired by this point, you're seeing double. Well, I appreciate your efforts. And I know God's going to bless you. you got a heart for this thing. I can just scan the building. I can't do this much. I get to cry. But listen, it takes a corn for God to do something. And there's always a group behind the scenes. 10% that will usually do 90% of the work, the praying, the labor, and the sacrifice. But I'm very thankful for you. Everybody sees me up here. But I'm such a small part. Without you all obeying God, there wouldn't be none of this. And I bless the Lord for it. I'm trying to preach tonight, but I, my souls are feeling good. I just had another image, Brother Ethan, of when we was wrestling with God. We come in and your whole church was right here. I was trying to explain it to a couple of good friends of mine, praying friends that understand the move of God and I was telling Brother Jason especially his church has been through struggles and then seen God bless them and I was explaining it to him and I said when Brother Ethan come up and they said preacher ain't nothing wrong we praying for you we got you back we know you need something from God I said a smile on his face I don't think a million dollars if he'd have won it he'd have grinned that big had the glow of God on him I'm talking about a God that's good to us. Amen. Give me a little more in these monitors if you don't mind, brother, just where I can hear it. But I bless the Lord tonight. Amen. He didn't have to, but he's been good these last four weeks. Amen. We battled a lot last week. That's a good, wonderful. Thank you, brother. We battled a lot. But look what God did by the end of the week. Amen. I'm excited about these days together. Amen. And I believe if we obey the Word of God, mind the Lord, ain't no telling what God will do this week. The price is worth the price. May we hear the Lord tonight. Second Samuel chapter number 12 verse number 7. And Nathan said to David. Thou art the man. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel. I anointed thee king over Israel. And I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul. And I gave thee thy master's house. And thy master's wives into thy bosom and gave thee the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that would have been too little, I want you to hear these words. This is much of my heart when we get there tonight. And if that had been too little, I would moreover have given unto thee such and such things. Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword, and hast taken his wife to be thy wife, and has slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from thine house, because thou hast despised me, and hast taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. Thus saith the Lord, because I will raise up evil against thee out of thine own house, and I will take thy wives before thine eyes, and give them unto thy neighbor, and they shall lie with thy wives in the sight of this son. Notice verse 12. We better let this fear get in our hearts tonight. For thou didst it secretly. But I will do this thing before all Israel and before the sun. David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan said unto David, The Lord also has put away thy sin. Thou shalt not die. Howbeit because by this deed Thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. The child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. 
We jumped it in the middle of the story, but it all makes sense here in a little while. But by the help of the Lord, I want to preach on this thought for just a little while. When the country preacher came to town. When the country preacher came to town. Brother Luke, you pray for us. Brother Luke Cole. Yes, Lord. God, I told you. Try me. Give me the recesses of my heart. Now that we have tried lost parts of my heart. Now that we have twin chairs, speak, search, be tried, and shine forth. God, we thank you, dear God, through shining the, through your word, God, through your servant, 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 God, through quite some time and we've had great crowds but I mean it's, it's about filled up tonight and I bless the Lord for it not because we're in the numbers but because you have a soul and you have needs tonight and the Lord loves you and we love you and I don't know where all you come from and I don't know where all what all your Bible knowledge is but I would imagine that most of us under the tent tonight have at least heard the name King David he's one of the most famous and popular men in the Bible in case you don't know all the things about him. Listen to how great this man was. And I'm doing this for a reason. Hang with me. King David, the Bible said, was one of the greatest men that Israel ever knew. He was the greatest king of Israel. The, the temple that is known as one of the wonders of the world. It is called Solomon. That's his son's temple. But really it was David's temple. He gathered over $30 million of his own money and supplies. He's one of the richest men that ever lived. But on top of that, he is known as one of the greatest warriors that there ever was. One of the greatest piano, what we musicians rather, that there ever was. Songwriters, most of your psalms in your Bible, which psalms means it's the hymn book of Israel. It's the songs they sang in Hebrew in the Old Testament. He wrote much of the psalms. I'm talking about a man that was oozing out with talent. But on top of that tonight, can you imagine this? God said he had a heart. After God. 
Then don't shrug that off. God's not a politician. He don't blow smoke and fluff people. He gave very few compliments to one person individually and singled them out. He called maybe a friend of God here and a righteous man of God there. But the only time in the Bible that he said a man had a heart after God is right here. Why do you emphasize that? Because when you think about David and I, you think about the king, you think about the psalmist, you think about the warrior, you think about the conqueror, you think about how he united Jerusalem, how he brought together the kingdom. But guess what? If you know very much about the Bible at all tonight, the very thing you'll think of as well is David had a problem with sin at a time in his life. David had a failure. David was a great man, but he had a great sin one time. And he killed a man over it because he wanted his wife. And he got caught in adultery. And he wound up killing her. And he made a mess out of his life. Why are you emphasizing that before you even get started tonight, preacher? I tell you why. Because ladies and gentlemen David's much greater than you are And David is much greater than I am I never would believe that God would say I have a heart after him to that level I don't believe I have all the talents David did And if you got the right estimation and humility Of yourself tonight You don't neither So here's my point tonight If it could happen to David It could happen to us As a matter of fact Paul said But for the grace of God So go I Paul said it this way. David's one of the greatest in the Old Testament. Outside of Christ, no doubt, Paul's the greatest in the New Testament. And Paul said it could happen to him if it wasn't for grace constraining him and grace helping him. So here's my point tonight. If Paul made a statement it could be him and David it was him, then we better look around tonight and say, I'm not near as bad as I think I am. I'm not near as strong as I think I am. And the devil don't play fair. And sin don't play fair. And if we don't watch out, the best of us in here, something could happen in our lives. The story really starts in chapter 11 when the Bible said that it was at the, it came to pass after the year was expired at the time when kings went forth to battle. And then it said it came to pass at evening time. Let me break that down for you tonight. In other words, here's what's going on in your Bible. David has done everything right so far in his life for the most part. He has obeyed God. He has done what he's supposed to. And all the Israel looks up to him. He is the man's man. But there came a day when David did not do the little things well. And it got him in a mess. What do you mean, preacher? The Bible said it was the time of the year when kings go forth to battle. That is the beginning of March on our calendar. It's after the weather has ended. It's time to conquer lands. And Israel's got an enemy surrounded and they're ready to take the lands. It's time to conquer something for God. It's time to give glory to God. But the Bible said when David should have been on the battlefield, oh, you better listen to me tonight. When David should have been on the battlefield, You apply that to your heart where we're at. He was actually still back at the palace when he should have been bowing and when he should have been battling and he was actually bowed up. And the Bible said about 3 o'clock evening time he come out on the palace walls and it seems as though David may have been given one of these. And he said, I ain't worried about getting something new. I want to strut around and talk about what I've already done for God. And he's looking as far this way and as far that way. Way. How you know that? Because if he was humble and if he had been right with God in that moment and if he had knew how bad he needed God like he did every other day, he would have been in the right place at the right time. But listen to me tonight. You're not always going to love God like you should. I'm preaching tonight, but I'm just a transparent Yes, I just shoot it to you straight. Some of you have never met me before. I'll be as real as I can with you, and you be as real as you can with me. And there's a real God that can help us tonight. I don't wake up every day, jump out of the bed, run four laps around my house or a motel, and say, I love Jesus. Glory to God. 
I got problems like you do. I have struggles like you have. Some days I'm down. Some days I'm battling. Some days my mind's a difficult thing. Some days I get bad news and it's a struggle just like you do. Some days the devil seems to be working overtime and it's a struggle. But watch this tonight. You may not always love God like you should, but if you'll just do the little things right, if you'll just be in the right places, if you'll just make sure you're accountable, it can keep you out of a lot of mess. David could have had a wrong heart, but if he'd have been on the battlefield, he could have never even got in the sin tonight, ladies and gentlemen, because if you're around a bunch of people where God said, even if your heart's cold, the Lord can help you and the devil won't get you. What I'm trying to tell you tonight is this. Sometimes you won't always have the right heart, but if you come here and if you stay in your church and if you stay in your Bible and if you stay accountable, young people People especially listen to me. We need each other. We need accountability in these days. These are difficult days to live in. And you're not always going to be on top of your game. And you need each other. We need that threefold cord. It's not easily broken. And if David would have just done the small things in obedience well, this would have never happened in his life. We better make sure we're operating in the will of God. But nonetheless, he misses the Lord. And here's where we're headed tonight. And so to make a long story short, very quickly, while he's out there, he looks over his banister and ended just like the devil. He never quits. Every day of David's life, he has walked around and around and around and around looking for a place to mess him up. Might I remind you, the devil lost at Calvary. Jesus Christ won when he said it is finished. And he got up out of the grave three days later. And we're the only religion in the world where our founder is alive and well. And can't nobody prove it otherwise. So he doesn't care if he loses. He's already lost. He only has to get us one time. You can win every day, but if you lose once, it'll make a mess in your life. And he's going around and around. And one day when David did the wrong thing, who was there? The devil. The devil and his forces saw exactly what David was up to and they planted a woman at the right time. She wasn't doing anything wrong. She was at the place she was supposed to be. He wasn't. But what he saw with his eyes in sin and temptation drew him. David said, I want her. Because he thought he was a big enough king that he could even do what God didn't want him to do. He said, bring her to me. I make the rules. Might I tell you, pride will get us in a mess. And sin will always take you further than you want to go. That's not mean preaching tonight. I didn't come to preach at you. It'll be tough for a little bit, but you hang with me. I'm not preaching at you. I'm preaching with you because it can happen to any of us. And I love you enough tonight to tell you the truth so you can get some help. So David commits the sin of adultery. He sends her back home. He says, I got away with it. But then she sends for him after just a few short weeks and says, I got bad news, David. I something happened. I'm with child. And David says, I want y'all to hear me tonight. Don't let the devil distract you. And everybody hear me tonight. You already hear, you might as well get some help from God. Don't let somebody distract you. I know the devil. Hear me tonight. And he says, oh boy, I got to do something. He said, Uriah, her husband ain't been home. They're out in battle where I'm supposed to be. They going to know it ain't him. What am I going to do? So he comes up with a plan. Instead of just repenting, getting it right before God, making it right with that man, and do the best he could to make it right, he says, no, sir. Not David. This might hurt me. And some of you tonight, if you don't get right with God, and if you don't let the Lord help you tonight, you know why it'll be? Because you're more worried about your reputation before me than you are how you stand with God in eternity. And you have the wrong perspective because you're full of pride. And it can happen to any of us. And any time we're not bowing and asking God for help, it's because we're bowing up in ourselves and we think we can do it. And David said, I got this. So he called him home from the battle and he said, Uriah, you're such a good soldier. You're one of my best. You're a mighty man of valor. Go home to your wife for a little while. He wakes up the next morning and Uriah is still there. He slept at the king's door. 
And he said, Uriah, why didn't you go home? He said, how dare I lay out with my family at home and spend time with them while my brethren is fighting and laying their lives on the line. He had character David didn't even have in them moments. He refused to lay down on God and his brethren. And so now David's wringing his hands again. And he says, what in the world am I going to do? So to make a long story short, here's how it ends. He says, the only thing I can do is I'm going to have to do something extreme. So he sends to the general of the military. And he says, Joab, you take Uriah. Put him in the hottest part of the battle. And then pull all our men back. And leave him by himself. It's basically murder by what they're going to lie and call suicide. And Uriah dies. And a family loses a good man. Children lose a good daddy. A woman gets taken advantage of and loses a good husband. That's because that's how the devil always lets sin in. It'll always be worse. It's like an alcohol commercial. It's like Budweiser in the Super Bowl. They show you the good. They don't show you the car wreck. They don't show you AA. They don't show you the busted family. They don't show you the drunken stupor. They don't show you the bruises on women. They don't show you children crying themselves asleep at night. You believe whatever you want to. But our nation's a bunch of drunks and it's an embarrassment. And our children are suffering. And they don't even have clothes on their back. No, I don't enjoy Budweiser commercials. I think about the babies. It would be funny if it wasn't so sad. Them babies are hungry. They're bruised and afflicted because they're not even the same person. When they're sober, they're a good man. But the alcohol changes them and it wrecks their life. And that's what sin does. It always controls and destroys. That's what it does to David. That's what it does to Uriah's family. So David says, well, hate that he died. You imagine being so cold hearted. Remember, he had a heart after God. But he still had sinful flesh just like we do. Bible says there's no good thing that dwelleth in us outside the Lord at salvation. You and me are as wicked as the worst person in prison. You say, well, I ain't done what he's done. You have the ability and so do I. If it wasn't for the Holy Spirit of God and restraining grace on the inside, we would be in the same mess tonight. We're no better than anybody. I don't care how long you've been saved. And so here's the mess. David says, well, I got away with it. He takes Bathsheba to be his wife because now she's a widow. Everything's good. Nobody knows. And David goes back and he sits on his throne and he says, Ha! I'm the king. Nobody knows. I got away with it. I covered it up. I mean, after all, I've done so much for the Lord. At least he owes me one little excuse me. I'll have it my way. And that's where the story picks up tonight where I read to you. And the Bible said that there was a country preacher that came to town. And Nathan looked at David and David said, so good to see you. And he said, yeah, good to see you too. He said, God's got a word for you. He didn't hear him how he got down to business. I like to think like them old time preachers I heard as a child growing up. Their finger was about as long as mine. But I remember them coming across that pulpit and saying something like that. I thought it was 12 foot long. Hitting me right here. I said, Lord, Mama done told him on me. He preached right to me. (laughs) Mama ain't talked to the preacher about nothing. The Lord knows. He said, let's get down to business, David. He said, all right. He said, let me tell you a little story. And he says, there's a rich man that had a lot of sheep, a lot of lambs. There was a poor man and he only had one. And he said, a stranger come, a visitor from a foreign town. And he said, they needed to to be able to feed this man some lamb meat. That's the custom of the Middle East. And so somebody's got to kill a lamb and feed it. That's how you take care of people. That's the customs of their culture. And so the rich man, Nathan says, he says, David, the rich man looks at all that he has. And he says, I don't want to lose anything I got. And so he uses his authority and influence as a rich man to go to the poor man, take his one lamb, take him up, sacrifice him, kill him, take the meat and feed the the stranger. 
the visitor. And said that poor man had just one little lamb. It was all he ever had. He treated him like a child, Nathan says. He held him. They went to bed at night. It was all he had. He was that poor. It broke his heart. And David, mind you, he still has that heart after God. He still has that underdog spirit to be for the underdogs. But he got caught up in sin. But now he's back to being normal in some ways and he's thinking correctly. Because it's about somebody else not here. Isn't it amazing how we can tell others what's right to do in their lives with God. But when it comes to us, we're full of excuses and we're full of pride. And we'll tell them, yeah, you better get right. All while excusing our sins because they're not like somebody else's. So their heart's involved. David jumps up off his throne. He says, whoever that man is, that's awful. Kill him. And then this is where the story picks up. And I'll give you three things God told David. Very quickly, and I'll be out of the way, the Lord willing. Number one, I find this. He exposed his sin. Verse 7, and Nathan said unto David, Thou art the man. He said, whoever killed that little lamb in this story you're telling, he told the country preacher, he said, that man deserves to die. And Nathan reared back with that long finger like I told you. And with all the boldness, he spoke to the king on behalf of God. And he pointed that finger right in his heart. He said, David, you are that man. Riri had only one thing. And that was his little family. You had the entire kingdom. And you killed what was his. And kept all of yours. He said, you are the man and for the first time in at least nine months so before you think God judge David too quick before I get into this part and you think God was too rough on him let me tell you this that baby's done been conceived that baby's done been born that baby's alive because we find out in a little while that they hold it till it dies so that means at least nine months but probably well over a year or more David has walked around and the Lord has said you need to get right confess your sin my spirit won't always strive with man David this is costing you David do what's right David you can't live like this and God's working on the inside but David refuses because he don't want people to know he don't want people to think that he's not this perfect great man and his pride holds him down and he saw he's got away with it and it's just a wrestling match with him and God on the inside but one day David realized he looked this way and he had it covered up with man you can lie to me you can lie to your preacher you can lie to your family you can lie to your spouse you can lie to your parents you can lie to anybody you want but you won't lie to God he knows all he sees all and just when David thought he had it covered he forgot to look this way and God said that's enough and he raised up a preacher and sent him that way and he said you are the man and judgment's coming here's the principle tonight when it comes to our sins if we will expose them to God listen you ain't got to tell everybody your sins if they ask you, it's just probably because they nosy. And if you go to a Baptist church, I promise you there's a few. When I got right with God and come home, there was always a few that wanted me to tell them some stuff. Nosy, just want to gossip. But you do have to tell God. The Bible says, here's the principle. David, if you'll expose it to me, I'll cover it. He'll cover it in the multitude of his mercies and grace. It never had to get out. God and David could have done business. It could have stayed a private sin. And God could have forgave him. Yes, there'll be judgment. Yes, there'll be some wounds. Yes, there'll be some difficulties. You do reap what you sow. But it never had to get that bad. But David refused to do his part. And so God had to go to step number two. And God said, all right, if you won't confess, it and get it right then I'm going to confess it but when I do when I do the exposing and you don't if you won't expose it and I do God said when I expose it I'm going to tell everybody Amen. haven't you seen people before I've heard testimony after testimony they'd say God dealt with me in an altar I had a private sin and I wouldn't get it right I bowed up on God cost me my marriage it got public 
Cost me my children. Cost me a job. Cost me a scholarship. Cost me this. Cost me that. Because sin has a high price tag. Before I give you the second one, let me just say this because I know how we are. I don't know if you Baptists or not. I know it's a Baptist meet. Most of us are. Or probably all of us think this way. All I know is Baptist. I've been one since nine months before I was born. Some of y'all get that about the time you eat tonight. Usually here's what we think. If I don't drink, if I don't do drugs, if I don't run around, I don't look at pornography, if I conquer six or seven big sins that everybody talks about and looks down in life, I'm all right with God. Might I say you need those sins conquered by the power of God in your life. They will kill you. They are important. I spent preaching a little bit a while ago. I spent some time talking about some of those sins. I obviously believe in that tonight. But Solomon said it's the little foxes that spoil the vine. You walk with God any amount of time and you get in your Bible and you get in church and you get filled with God. You pray you're going to quit them things very quickly. Because you can't live for God in the presence of God with sins like that. You'll grow out of those just like a newborn grows out of a bottle and gets on meat. You get on the higher things. God grows you in God. But let me just preach to those for a little while that's been saved a while. We got to plow a little bit tonight if we're going to go to some new levels with God this week. God's searching deep. That's His burden tonight. It's the little foxes. What about gossip? What about pride? What about backbiting? What about being rude? I tell you what, J.L. Smith, the great preacher of yesteryear said, he said, you can't be wrong with your wife and talk to her like a dog at the house and come to the house of God and be right with God. You say, I don't like that kind of preaching. My flesh don't like it neither. That's why we need it. It ain't easy, but it's right. You can't talk wrong to each other. You can't mistreat people at your job. You can't cheat. I don't care if it's a quarter. You can't cheat, be a liar, steal. I don't care if it's as much as you take a hanger out of a hotel. If you do that on purpose and take from somebody into the littlest things I can think of tonight, all every bit of it is grievous to God. He is perfectly holy. And that doesn't mean that God's holding us accountable of things you don't know about tonight. Don't panic. But hear me. If God speaks to your heart and says, you're the man there and thou art the man there and this is wrong and I want that God might even put something on your heart tonight that's not even a sin it's just a test it's just something about God knows a weakness you have and he just wants to help you what I'm saying is this obedience is better than sacrifice and until we wholly obey God we cannot see God bless us and even in the smallest of sins if we cover them long enough one day God will say if you ain't going to deal with it I will and it's a lot more severe in public when God has to deal with it because we won't deal with God here's a small one and I'm moving on the Bible even says this whatsoever is not a faith is sin you may just be transparent with me tonight I want you to understand I ain't preaching to you like this because I'm perfect I'm as much preaching to myself as I am you I how the devil will lie to you I had to confess some unbelief Friday night. God put something on my heart before service. God spoke to Brother Ethan as he was walking up before service. And I didn't tell him and he didn't tell me because I was afraid I was wrong and didn't have enough faith that I heard God and he'd the same way. And we kept looking at each other saying, well, what do you think? We out there in the field about to lose our mind. I know what I felt in my heart. He knows what he felt in his heart. We got a friend. We wanted to make sure everything's all right with his tent. Me, we're worried about that. And finally, thank God for some wisdom, Brother Green spoke up and said, Man, I just don't know how you close when you can't see the finish line yet. Amen. At that time, Brother Ethan finally broke. He tells how God spoke to him. He tells me. I said, Well, my goodness, why didn't you tell? Of course, I can't fuss at you too much because I didn't tell you neither. But man, that would have helped me and I'd have told you. And he's like, well, if you'd have told me, I'd have told you. As funny as that is, that's how we live, ain't it? 
I understand we got to try the spirits. I understand you don't speak too quick. But at the same time, if God tells you something, if God gives you a first, if God lays something in your heart, if God makes it real to you, even the unbelief is seeing that it can hold you back in prayer and blessings from God. And to the littlest things, we got to be sensitive and right with the Lord because if we don't do business with God, He can't bless us. So no matter what side you're on tonight, what we consider big sins, whether you're tonight and you're lost and you've never been forgiven, or whether you're right down to one of the most spiritual people in the building, all of us from time to time need to expose ourselves before God and say, Lord, search us. Like the psalmist said, see if there be any wicked way in me. Listen to this. Here's where we're getting to in our close. Find expose this sin, examine his servant. Verse 8. I would, if that had been too little, I would moreover have given unto thee such and such things. God doesn't just expose the sin. He examines the servant. Ladies and gentlemen, might I say it this way tonight. God got down to business. God didn't treat the symptoms. He got to the heart of the problem. The problem was not adultery. The problem is not Bathsheba in and of itself. The problem is not even David being king. It's not the fact of this or that. At the end of the day, God went right to where the problem was. And the problem was this, that David had gotten used to the blessings of God and he thought he deserved them and he wanted something God didn't give him. In other words, he looked around and said, out of ten things in this kingdom, I've got nine of them, but there's one thing I can't have and that's all I want because that's how our flesh is. That's how selfish we are. And so God goes to the root of the problem and he says, David, if you'd have wanted more, I'd have gave you such and such things means this. God says, David, look around. Yes, you can't have another man's wife, but if you wanted more land, I'd have gave it to you. If you wanted more money, I'd have gave it to you. If you wanted this, I'd have gave it to you. If you wanted that, I'd have gave it to you. Such and such things, David. I love you and favor you so much. I'd have gave you anything. And one of the most heartbreaking, one of the most fearful things that God deals with my heart about is I don't want to ever get to the place, Brother Brent, where God is speaking to me and saying such and such things. Amen. What would it be like, Brother Ethan, to see all of this that some people never see in their life and get sideways with God over some little thing after He's given me And He's give you all of this. Explain being here tonight. How God brought you here. How God loved on you. How God has favored your life. To sit in the presence of God. And your eternity's changed if you're saved. Or it could be saved tonight. Or changed tonight if you get saved by the grace of God. I'm just telling you. He said look at yourself David. The problem's within you. Pride has caused you to be ungrateful and selfish. And it's cost you everything. But David if you want it something I'd have gave it to you wouldn't it be something tonight to walk under this tent and to fill a pew sit in one of these chairs and after all God's done for you after all God's done for all of us to sit there and say I'm just not happy still well my weekend wasn't perfect well God hasn't answered all my prayers Well, God could have done this. Well, I really wanted that. And you miss out. The devil blinds you from seeing all the things that God has done. Such and such things tonight. The Lord said, if that ain't enough, I'll do more. If that ain't enough, I'll do this. Matter of fact, might I just say this tonight? He did the best that heaven had when He bankrupted heaven and sent His only begotten Son and He bled and died for you and me. And He said, I give it all. And it was the joy set before Him. And the Lord died to set us free if all He ever did was save us and give us a home in heaven tonight. That's enough to shout. Even on our worst of days the devil lies to us I know it ain't all perfect but look at how good God's been that's why we were shouting earlier that's why some of you came and thanked God and others of you need to tonight I'm trying to tell you tonight God's give us more than we ever deserved 
But David lost sight of it and God had to go to talking to him. And I believe God's talking to some of us tonight. You say, was it really that bad? Did he, when he examined him, preacher, was it really that bad in David's life? Listen to this and we'll get to the last one. Psalms 51. That's where David's prayer of confession. He repents before God and gets right. You can read it when you get home. But in those verses in Psalms 51, we find that David confesses that his communion with God was interrupted. He penned those psalms during that time. His heart was out, his heart that he worshiped God with was out of tune. He lost all his joy in serving God. And fear come on him. And here's what he said. He said, God, don't take thy spirit from me. That ain't New Testament. That ain't Scripture to say once you get saved, if you sin, you get lost. That's Old Testament where the Holy Spirit would come on a man and use him and come off. And here was David's fear. His predecessor, the king before him, Saul, who was not God's choice, who was full of pride. He made a wreck out of his life and died by his own sword or wounded by his own sword, killed by the enemy. Why? Because he refused to repent and he didn't do right with God. And the the spirit left him. Had he made a fool of his life, David didn't want to die in embarrassment like Saul did. Amen. Can I tell you tonight, we can all think of people who have wrecked their lives, who used to be something, but sin brought them down. And they died an embarrassing death. And it can happen to any of us tonight. You're here tonight and sin's crept in your life. Whether you want to call it big sins, little sins, they all cost us. How's your communion with God? How's your worship? When was the last time you was able to truly worship? Now, I'm not just saying shout because others are. I'm not just saying come to the altar because everybody else is. I'm talking about it was genuinely in your heart and you knew God and you heard God and you could worship and love was busting out and joy's on the inside and victory's in your life and you know that heaven's listening and the blessings of God are on your life. Amen. When we're saved and right with God, that's the life we can live and there's nothing like it. But when you let sin get a hold of you, when you play around with the things of this world, if you ain't careful, You'll wind up sitting somewhere lonely. No communion. You can't hear God. You can't worship. Your harp's out of tune, if you will. You're miserable. You're afraid. How come David? David sins worse than Saul's if we're going to play that game. You want to know why? Because David knew how to repent. Saul didn't. Those of us under this tent, ain't none of us perfect. But if you'll come tonight with a genuine heart and do whatever God puts in your heart in a little while and get right with God, God will forgive you. God will bless you. God will say, I don't have to die. I will take the kingdom, if you will, from you. I can wash all that away. I can give you mercy and grace in your life again. But if you won't repent, you'll die like Saul, miserable. Amen. In your own pride, in your own strength, trying to make it happen. But David... God humble when it needed to be. And he said, God, forgive me. 
And God heard his cry. For seven days, David fasted and prayed before God that he would change his mind and not let that baby die. But at the end of seven days, the number of completion in your Bible, Scripture says that baby died. David got up. You better hear me tonight. If you ain't heard nothing I said tonight, you better hear this. David got up, put on a fresh garment of clothes, went into the banqueting hall after he found out his boy was gone that him and Bathsheba had him seeing. Sits down at the table and begins to eat. His servants say, what's wrong with you? Who in the world weeps and cries and prays while their boy's still alive? But then when he's dead, they go back and take the morning clothes off and go to eat. Here's how we know David genuinely was sorry before God. Because he don't blame God. You want to know if you've really gotten right with God in your life? Are you still blaming Him for where you're at? Are you still saying it's God's fault or God put me here? God let my family do this or this person. Are you a victim tonight? Are you blaming God and other people? Or have you come to the place and say, it doesn't matter. It may not have been easy. It may not have been fair. But at the end of the day, I'm responsible for me. You're responsible for you. There's consequences for our actions. We're responsible for a whole life. You do good, it carries good consequences. You do bad, it does bad. There is no passes in life, no matter what people today want to say you will still reap what you sow we are accountable and here's how we know David repented because here's what he said to him he said while my boy was alive there was still a chance that God could show mercy but once he's taken him he said boys he can't come back to me but if I'm right with God and ready to meet God one day I can go to him in heaven and here's what he's saying He's saying, God didn't do wrong. I did. Really, at the end of the day, David's saying the boy shouldn't be alive and neither should I. God's had mercy regardless. I'm not blaming him. It was my fault and I'm going to give God glory and move on by the grace of God. And here's where the goodness of God lands. And we'll close tonight. Miss Michaela, you want to come if you don't mind. Bible says that night David went into his wife Bathsheba and they conceived and bared another son nine months later. And the Bible said that when this little boy come out of the mercy of God, out of all of that tragedy, God gave them a mercy and gave them grace when He gave them another baby. And He said, I want you to call him Solomon. That may not seem like much, but hear me tonight. Don't let the devil not let you hear this. Because here's what he's going to tell a bunch of you. You've sinned too much. You've gone too far. God don't love you anymore. There's no hope in your life. Forget the whole thing. God can't do for you what he's done for us. Watch this. You ain't no worse than David tonight. Adultery, murder, lying. That's as bad as it gets. But watch this. The Bible said that he called him Solomon. You look that up in your Bible. Solomon's name means peace. Here's what God did. It's as though God walked back into his life after all the failure. After all the brokenness. After all the hardship. After all the letdown. All the embarrassment. Once David repented, God comes and blesses him. He says, call him Solomon. He says, because peace. It's as though God is saying, David, I forgive you. All is well. Forgive yourself. There's peace between you and me, David. And I can bless your life again. I want you to know tonight there's peace if you'll come and get right. God will if you will. He loves you tonight. He died for you. He don't just love perfect people. That'd be nobody. But for the grace of God, all of us need the same grace tonight. Whether it's little foxes that are messing your vines, or whether you've got some big strongholds of sins that could cost you everything, all of it will hinder us spiritually. And I pray we'd be tender before God tonight. we come and say, God, forgive me. I know you've been good. I know such and such things. I don't want to be like this anymore. God, whatever it is, you tell God and say, I'm sorry. 
There's a God who will extend grace and mercy on this altar. And He'll give you a Solomon. You want a Solomon in your life? You want peace? You want goodness? You want grace? You got to do what David did to get a Solomon. David was willing to get right with God. He was willing to do whatever God said. And that's what we have to be willing to do tonight. You can't get a Solomon if you don't do it God's way. But I promise you tonight, if we get tender and right with God, there's no telling what all Solomons will get in our lives. And I tell you how far grace can go right before she sings tonight. You ever heard of the book of Proverbs? Consider the book of wisdom in our Bible. Even the secular world reads Proverbs for good wisdom. Proverbs 31, the last proverb, is written about a godly woman. What a godly woman looks like. What a holy woman looks like. You know who wrote Proverbs 31 according to Jewish history? Solomon. And you know who Solomon wrote it about? The only woman he knew on that level. His mother Bathsheba. I'm talking about the one who her life in some of the beginning started with committing sin with the king, her husband dying, her children broken, having a baby die in sin, being a humiliation before people, having to be singled out by God with David. But it ain't how you start. It's how you end with God. Grace went so deep when they got right that God washed it all away in Calvary's blood. And by the time she dies, Solomon writes and pens the 31st proverb and says, Who can find a virtuous woman? For her price is far above rubies. Virtuous? <laughs> Maybe some half backslid carnal mean person would say, she ain't virtuous. I know what she did. God says, I don't know what you're talking about. They confess that. I put it under the blood. Some of you tonight, God's done forgive you. You need to forgive yourself. And move on. Some of you tonight, you need to be saved. I wonder, are you going to come and bow and let God love on you and help you? Are you going to bow up and walk out the same miserable wreck you was when you come in? And the longer you let it go, the worse it's going to get. But you hear me tonight. This whole thing can end right here. It don't have to get no worse in your life. Come get saved. Get it under the blood. You're saved. You got troubles. You got sins. Get them under the blood. If you will expose, He will cover. You don't have to lose it all. You don't have to become an example. You don't have to let everything in your life blow apart and the devil laugh at you. Say, but preacher, it's a mess. It ain't how you start. It's how you end. God will give you a Solomon. And one day, maybe them Solomons in your life will write about you like Solomon did Bathsheba. God's grace can go deeper tonight. The country preacher, the sweet Holy Ghost of God's coming by tonight. He's speaking to our hearts. He's pointing out things in your life and mine. I wonder, what are we going to say when the country preacher's talking to us tonight? Let's stand all over the building. She's going to sing. Why don't you come and mind God tonight? Mind the Lord.